Christmas, Yule, whatever you call it, from your culture or religion, but we're also here to celebrate the, the life and work of Shirin Akina, who was, of course, the chairman of uh, the British Respect Society for myself, and indeed was the, the engine and heart of the society from its very initiation. Um, we're going to have three presentations, speeches this evening. The first by David Mitchell, our, our husband, then Harun Yilmaz, a historian who's going to talk about her work, and then her granddaughter, Colleen. Um, David's going to talk about her attitude to work, uh, towards work. Um, I, I started reading Shireen's work, or some of it, uh, earlier this year, and um, having written a PhD in history myself at Cambridge, I very much appreciated uh, the empiricist in her. Uh, I think it's, it's wonderful when people research with a real interest in people, and they let, uh, through the way they write, people tell their own stories. And of course, Shirin uh, could speak Slavic languages, Turkic languages, so she had a very wide reach in terms of whose stories she could help tell. Um, so it's, it's something I, I very much empathize with. But I, I'll stop there, and I'll let David uh, continue. Shirin had a great facility to speak extensively and also really lectured without notes. I'm afraid I don't have those skills, so I'm afraid I have a text. <laughs> One evening in 1935, a young man who'd just been called to the bar and was about to go home to Calcutta went to the theater in St. Martin's Lane. He found himself sitting next to an attractive young woman who'd recently graduated in music from U University College Aberystwyth and was in London for an audition with the BBC. Before the curtain rose, he noticed she was reading a biography of Mahatma Gandhi. This led to an animated conversation, journeys to India, and to their marriage. The young barrister was Ziauddin Ahmed, from a Mughal family in Bengal. His father had taken an LLB at Oxford and was also called to the bar. Like his grandfather, who was at Lincoln's Inn in the 1870s. The Welsh musician was Mary Jones, whose father was from Harlem, but had worked in London for the Manchester Guardian, played rugby for London Welsh, and served as choir master at the Jewish Chapel in the city. He'd been killed at Passchendaele in 1917. Before partition in 1947, Zia and Mary had four children, of whom Shireen was the third, with two other brothers born later. Both Zia and his father were members of the Congress Party and were in favour of a federal India rather than the creation of a separate state of Pakistan. However, circumstances forced them to flee to Pakistan, where subsequently Zia joined the Foreign Service. Initially, he served in London, where Shireen attended a prep school in Kew, and then briefly St. Paul's Girls' School. By this time, she'd become an accomplished violinist. In 1954, her father was posted to India, to Shillong, in Assam, where she attended the Loretto Convent. In 1956, Zia was sent to The Hague, and after a year in the French section of the International School, Shireen went to the Amsterdam Music Lyceum, studying the violin under Oscar Bach and Hermann Krebs. Four years later, after an audition with David Oistrakh, she moved to the Moscow State Conservatoire under his overall direction. Foreign students at the Conservatoire were given personal lessons in Russian, and Shireen had a wonderful teacher. As her love for Russian waxed, her enthusiasm for life as a solo violinist waned. Whilst in Moscow, Shireen married Murat Akina, a Turkish Cypriot serving the embassy of the newly independent state. With the troubles in Cyprus in 1964, the government in Nicosia stopped paying the Turkish Cypriots in the civil service, and Shireen and Murat moved to Ankara. One evening, they drove into the country together with Murat's parents and a nephew, 
whom they brought to Turkey for medical treatment. The car was hit head on by a lorry and all were killed, save Shireen, who at the time was seven months pregnant. <coughs> she came to London where her mother had a house and lived with John, one of her brothers, who was at King's College. Her son, Metin, was born a few weeks later. As she had no English qualifications, she took three A and several O levels in a year, and then entered the School of Slavonic and East European Studies to read Russian language and literature, with subsidiary subjects, modern and Ottoman Turkish, at SOAS. She took a first with special reference to comparative Slavonic philology. For the next 10 years, she worked on her thesis, the religious language of Tatar Belarusians, but at the same time was a research assistant at UCL, compiling a Belarusian English dictionary of the 16th and 17th century economic and administrative terminology, and later at SOAS, compiling an Uzbek English dictionary. During this period, Shireen and I were married in the spring of 1973. The Soviet intervention in Afghanistan in 1979 led to a surge of interest in Central Asia in the West, and Shireen published her first major work, Islamic Peoples of the Soviet Union, in 1983. Government concern resulted in several new academic initiatives, including the establishment of a lectureship in Central Asian Studies at SOAS in 1985, to which Shireen was appointed. But how did her childhood, education, and early academic experience shape her work? Her early years had a profound effect on Shireen's respect for religion and nurtured an interest in theology. Her family kept all the Muslim and Christian festivals. Her Indian grandmother who visited them in London was a pious Muslim. And she was introduced to both Anglican and Roman Catholic thought and practice at her respective schools. One experience that she never forgot was an official visit with her father <coughs> to a Hindu temple of Hanuman, the monkey god. Within the grounds was a large tribe of monkeys. The principal male, to the onlookers a personification of the god, boldly approached Shireen and offered her a half-chewed banana. <laughs> Seeing her concern, her father whispered that she must take and eat it. As to the Hindu pilgrims, it was a very great honour, which she must respect. Like her father, Shireen was always drawn to Central Asia, knowing that her Mughal ancestors originally hailed from the Fahana Valley. So she was pleased when the opportunity arose to study the region. The professional and disciplined teaching at the conservatoire and hours of violin practice gave her an ability to work for long hours with a remarkable degree of concentration. She hated to be disturbed, even by those she loved. This ability was essential, as she was a perfectionist and would spend hours dotting every I and crossing every T of a paper she was writing. Focus and determination are closely allied Towards the end of the tragic civil war, Shireen and a colleague were driving to a provincial town for a meeting, when there was a lot of noise emanating from the hills on one side of the road. The driver spoke anxiously to Shireen in Russian. A fellow traveller told me later that on asking of the nature of the conversation, Shireen replied that he was concerned at the noise, but I explained that it was only small arms fire and there were no mortars or artillery, so it was nothing to worry about, and he should drive on. By nature, Shireen was very independent, and the harsh criticism of Islamic peoples of the Soviet Union strengthened her resolve to follow her own star, and thereafter she never read any reviews or engaged with social media. She believed that her work would be judged by future generations, and her life by a higher authority on her death. She was vindicated in the case of Islamic peoples as both the second edition was published in London as well as four 
pirated translated editions in Russian, Arabic, and two separate ones in Persian. In 1985, when Shireen joined SARAS, the school was rejecting area studies, which had been its strength since its foundation, in favor of political science with its all-embracing theories. This was at odds with her mindset, for she believed that it was essential to try to understand a society in depth to be able to make any meaningful observation. Shireen was essentially a comparative Slavonic and Turkic philologist who became a modern historian of Central Asia. And she was not, not a political scientist. Historians are concerned with what happened, how it happened, and with luck, why it happened. It's not a historian's job to say whether an action was morally good or bad, or to predict the future. That is for politicians, moralists, and journalists. Finally, Shireen had a great enthusiasm for life and loved people and ideas, reasoned why she enjoyed teaching and a public life, the latter which was encouraged by the nature of her appointment in 1985. She valued lecturing at the NATO Defence College in Rome and the Royal Defence College in London, as well as broadcasting and advising in the shooting of documentaries. She particularly appreciated monitoring elections in Central Asia, which gave her the opportunity to visit many new places and meet a great <coughs> variety of people. I suspect that some of her interlocutors thought they were being subjected to the third degree but she was always seeking to understand and learn from their experiences and lives. <coughs> Shireen often told me, you won't learn anything of the world by talking about yourself. Uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Harun Lumas, um, who's going to talk about Shirin's published work. Please put your hands up your mouth, please. It's good that I haven't forgotten my text at home. Uh, <laughs> my um, uh, before uh, uh, share my, uh, the brief text I prepared with you, uh, probably I should tell you the most important thing at the beginning. Uh, Shirin was a, a mentor uh, for me when I wrote my doctoral thesis. Although we had no um, you know, institutional connections, I was in Oxford, he, she was in London. Uh, despite that, uh, she, the, probably if you know Shirin, uh, you can imagine with her full energy and enthusiasm, uh, she helped me so much. Uh, to go further, uh, finish the thesis as well, and then later on publish it. So that's why um, it's an honor for me actually uh, to talk about her and her uh, academic life. Um, I always uh, feel um, um, very uh, I, I, uh, fond uh, memories um, when I think about her. Um, so. Uh, Dr. Shin Akina was not a person of comfort zones. She always liked to be a challenger. Her academic career was a voyage through various languages, cultures, and disciplines. In 1965, she chose to, be, to make a radical career change and study independently to gain qualifications to enter university and successfully took A-levels in Russian, Latin, English language and, language and literature. In 1966, she applied to the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies, CIS, in the University of London, for a place to read Russian language and literature. As um, she was a challenger, uh, studying a Slavic language was not enough for her. She also took subsidiary subjects of modern and Ottoman Turkish at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Completing her BA honors with a, <coughs> a first in 1970, 
I can uh, immediately embark on doctoral research again at SEAS. Her doctoral research was concerned with the religious language of the Lithuanian Tatars. This peculiar minority originated in Central Asia, gradually moved westwards, converted to Islam on the way, and settled in the Grand Duchy in the 14th, 15th centuries. They lost their native language and instead adopted Belarusian and Polish. However, they remained Muslims and in their religious writings continued to use the Arabic script, adapting it to uh, represent Slavonic phonology. Where necessary, they invented new letters to convey Slav's Slavic sounds. Similarly, they used Christian uh, terminology to express general religious concepts, but adapted words of uh, Arabic, Persian, Turkish origin to convey ideas that were specific to Islam. In the West territory and long history of Eurasia, there has always been crisscrossing identities, such as the Christianized Turkic-speaking Kupchaks and Gagos, or Turkified Armenians in Ukraine, or the Turkified Greeks in the Caucasus. Very often, these ethnicities had their own hybrid vernacular, secular, and theological pieces of literature written in different scripts, such as Kupchak texts written in the Armenian alphabet. Studying the history, language, and culture of these identities <coughs> needs multi-layered scholarship and leaving behind one's cultural comfort zone. Only scholarly travelers between cultures and languages like Akiner could succeed in such a daring task. Although she successfully completed her PhD in 1980, in the age of typewriters and fountain pens, there were too many diacritics to publish the thesis. It had to wait for three decades until the technology caught up and the computers could generate the galaxy of diacritics. In her words, uh, the doctoral thesis heightened my awareness of three important areas of encounter, East, West, Islamic, Christian, Turkic, Slavic. If the Tatars of Lithuania was a microcosm of such encounters, there was another crossroad of ethnicities religions and cultures for the last two millennia on a much bigger scale, Central Asia. While writing her thesis, she was also a research assistant, both at the UCL and SOAS. At SOAS, she compiled an Uzbek English dictionary, which was published in 1980. Parallel to the British strategic interests, Central Asia attracted scholarly attention in the 19th century. However, the establishment of the Soviet rule in the region and then the independence of the Indian subcontinent turned Central Asia into a distant territory. The confrontations between the Soviet Union and the U United States, the two superpowers of the Cold War era, moved from Cuba to Latin America, Middle East, and Vietnam, and so did the research funds uh, for scholars. When Akiner was finishing her thesis and the Uzbek English Dictionary, the Cold War knocked on the door of Central Asia. In 1978, the CIA started to fund the armed groups clashing with the pro-Soviet government in Afghanistan. And in December 1979, the Soviet army entered Afghanistan. For the first time since 1920, Central Asia became a matter of interest again. Akiner's reply to this rising interest was publishing a new book in 1983, Islamic Peoples of the Soviet Union, with an appendix on the non-Muslim Turkish peoples of the Soviet Union. This work quickly became a guidebook to dozens of ethnicities and nationalities from the Lezgis of the Caucasus to the Karanchis of Xinjiang and Kazakhstan for the English-speaking researchers. It was republished after three years. As Dr. Akina summarizes, at that time, there were a few scattered in the individuals who had expertise on various aspects of the region's culture and history, but there was no institutional framework within which to coordinate and develop the study of the region as a whole. More specifically, there was a pressing need to develop expertise on contemporary Soviet Central Asia, which at that time was almost unknown territory for most Soviet scholars. 
In 1985, Akuna filled a huge gap, uh, this huge gap, and became the first lecturer in Central Inner Asian Studies at SOAS, a post she held until 2008. Again, in her words, her task was putting Central Asia on the map. During her tenure, she lectured Uzbek and Uyghur languages and ran courses covering the culture, history, politics, and religion of Central Asia. As the first holder of the post, she had to prepare basic teaching materials and course programs from scratch. After her, her tenure ended in 2008, she was appointed a research associate at SOAS and became a senior research fellow at the Cambridge Central Asian Forum. Her undergraduate and graduate students from the UK and Central Asia went on to high level posts in academia and government. Um, she was a kind mentor, offering advice and practical help when it was needed. She treated her younger colleagues and students as equals. Indomitable, intellectually tough, sharp in opposition, she was in equal measure, inordinately kind and open to new people and ideas, and unstinting in giving her time to young scholars. In 1997, she became the founding editor of Central Asian Research Forum to provide a platform for publishing cutting-edge research on the Central Asian region. Today, 29 monograms, monographs on the region have been published. As a dynamic and charismatic member of academia, Akiner was always after bringing the intellectual worlds of Britain and Central Asia together. No one better bridged the supposed divide between cultures and peoples than Shirin Akuna herself. In the meantime, she also conducted research and published a copious amount of books, edited volumes, and articles on Central Asia. The subjects range from the Kazakh national identity formation to post-Civil War Tajikistan, the political conflict and its fluctuations in Kyrgyzstan, the interaction between region, sta uh, religion, state, and society in Central Asia, the energy and security policies among the littoral states of Caspian Sea, domestic politics and foreign affairs of Afghanistan, uh, and so on. In 2011, the former Soviet republics in Central Asia celebrated their 20th independence. Two long decades gave enough time for each country to follow a different traje trajectory and develop their priorities and alliances in international relations. Subsequently, Akhenar's works assessed the foreign policies of individual states. In the second half of the decade, parallel to the developments, her works discussed the role of China and the new Silk Road in the region. Aside from her love of linguistics and regional studies, Akhenar had a lifelong passion for theology and religion. It is worth noting that her interest in Belarusian Tatars never faded away. Her last paper, published in 2017, was about the cultural hybridity in Tatar literature in Northeast Europe. In her work, she always tried to identify the intertwined local and regional dynamics. Ever, uh, ever alert, Akiner probed beneath the outer surface of evidence. She often chose to add multiple factors and dimensions into her analysis of events instead of underpinning imperial or Eurocentric narratives. At the same time, Akuner was a demanded regional expert among governmental and non-governmental organizations. She gave briefings at the Cabinet Office, Prime Minister's Office, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Ministry of Defense, House of Commons in the UK, international organizations and non-governmental organizations such as the European Commission, International Committee of the Red Cross, UNESCO, and UNHCR, and security organizations such as NATO. She won many awards for her research and teaching, including the NATO Award for Outstanding Lecture Series at NATO Defense College in 2005, Sir Percy Sykes Medal for Services to Asian Studies by the Royal Society of Asian Studies in 2006, and International Genghis Aik Award in 2013.
Um, it's the reflections and memories of Nick Kitson, um, an officer in the British Army who studied the, uh, uh, on an MA course that Shireen uh, taught. He can't be with us tonight, so Christine is going to read out the reflections he's, he's prepared. A few years back, as a young British Army major, I had the opportunity of a year out of uniform for a master's at SOAS. Having read Arabic and Islamic studies some 10 years previously, I decided to brush up my language skills. Arabic translation was to be my major, and knowing little of the Muslim world beyond the Middle East, I adventurously chose Central Asian studies as one of my minors. Shireen, however, had different ideas, and it didn't take long for this arrangement to be reversed. Central Asian studies became my major, and my other minor was to be a Russian reading course. <laughs> there is an old military adage that no plan survives contact with battles. I knew instantly that Shireen was supposed to be reckoned with. Her sheer dynamism and passion left me in no doubt that no matter the what the subject, this was the person to inspire me through a year of postgraduate study. And of course, she did not disappoint and became a lifelong companion, uh, inspiration and friend. And I've seen plenty of leaders in my time, few compare. As a soldier turning up at SOAS, I did not expect to fit in. But Shireen's strategic outlook and work with international organizations, embassies, and governments made her the perfect one to channel my experiences and professional knowledge. Guided by her advice, my dissertation explored the spread of Islamic extremism in Central Asia. Burning the midnight oil, as you do the day before your work is due, I was only able to add a footnote about the Twin Towers attack. It was September 11th, 2001. Having known almost nothing about the history and cultures of Central Asia, now suddenly I had much of the background to a world-changing event at my fingertips. 9-11 changed many of our lives, not least that of a British Army officer. So, pitching up at Kabul airport a year later, both I and, in a small measure, the British Army was infinitely better equipped thanks to Shireen's knowledge, empathy, and perspective. And this came into their own for me when I was, in 2009, a battle group commander with 1,400 British soldiers in a particularly difficult and isolated part of southern Afghanistan, which had been a crossroads of cultures, tribes, and commerce for centuries. Frequently I sat, awkwardly cross-legged on the floor, attempting to recline against cushions in my equally inflexible military fatigues, with the district governor, chief of police, and various others, a strange Ferengi amongst these Kipling-esque characters, Ferengi meaning foreigner, Dipping deliciously, freshly, this, dipping deliciously freshly baked flatbread into the communal pot of not so delicious mutton, then gorging on pomegranates, most of which ended up on my lap or face, <coughs> my mind went back to Shireen. I could not have been more grateful for her insights, as I did my best to engage with and influence these community leaders, most of whom could not read or write, let alone care about central government in Kabul or even the provincial capital. Never mind understand anything about what a bunch of British soldiers were doing in their district. You might as well have been fresh from the Battle of Maiwan 150 years previously, or another detachment of the Red Army for all they knew or cared. I knew that all that mattered to them was how they would profit from their positions and survive as long as possible. And I knew that all that mattered to the local population was feeding and protecting their families while staying out of trouble. Foreign troops brought trouble for both, and, if not careful, we would end up purely as a tool for one against the other. What Shireen taught me was how the fundamental factors and interactions <coughs> of daily life, culture, language, tribe, family, commerce, travel, access to water, light, warmth, and food were what drove everything in such remote areas. <coughs> no amount of overseas aid programs, counterinsurgency strategies, or government centralization were going to change this anytime soon. Political harmony, security, and stability were all based around the basic needs and culture of the local population, underpinned by hope and the prospect of improving prosperity. Education, supported by educated and incorrupt leaders, was the key to making community prosperity and stability endure. And Shireen was the one who played the largest role in providing the education I needed in such a challenging role, trying to do the right by the locals while life and limb were being lost on a daily basis. She and David also sent me the most 
wonderfully exquisite Red Cross parcels, shoe boxes beautifully packed with chocolate odvers, parmesan, cured meat, and other fine delicacies to break up seven months of army rations. I confess I shared none of it with the district governor. <laughs> it's no longer a military one, but I take my hat off to dear Shireen, and I know that my intense gratitude for her contribution and inspiration will be mirrored by everyone here.